contains multiple recommendations related to climate change. The first of which is to revise the capability and development plan to address climate change. Um, so that is on page three. Subdivision 20 is greenhouse gas emissions and climate change is added to the capability development plan to read. Climate change poses serious risks to human health functioning ecosystems that support a diversity of species and economic growth, and are not tourist, forestry, and agricultural industries. The primary driver of climate change in Vermont and elsewhere is the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels, which has a warming effect that is amplified because atmospheric water vapor, another greenhouse gas, increases as temperature rises. Vermont should minimize its emission of greenhouse gases and because the climate is changing, ensure that the design and materials used in development enable projects to withstand an increase in extreme weather events and adapt to other changes in the weather and environment. Uh, there are 19 other um, subdivisions in the Capability and Development Plan. They were adopted in 1973, and they are the um, legislative findings detail to the legislative intent of Act 250. So this would be adding a new one related to climate change. And it would be a new one at the end of that list. Yes. And so do you have that list or I was just about to start looking it up or is it somewhere where's the easiest place we could find them? Um, it is appendix number it is appendix number five in your activity report. Um, so I could pull it up on the iPad, I think, if you want to look, if you want to see it or uh, do others want to see that? Yes, yeah.
ready to move on? Take us to the next slide. Okay, so on page four, um, it adds um, language about ecosystem protection, which
Uh, there's an intrinsic worth of our natural assets. And that intrinsic worth means that we gain, that it doesn't have to necessarily be human derived and, or human benefit. And I only throw that out as a concept because when we talk about capital, we're assuming that there's only an anthropogenic value of these natural assets. Trying out different things for size. Mm -hmm. I think that might help capture both the, you know, the public benefit as well as the intrinsic worth of our natural ecosystems. You know, when you say natural capital, I have an understanding of its nexus to the uh, to the land and the ecology of the land. But when you add social there, it, it's a very subjective to me uh, uh, criteria. I mean, uh, maybe it's social for a while, and maybe it changes because of either you know, something else comes into the, the landscape that you want to encourage, and, and you say it changes uh, in terms of what you're looking at for either. You know, uh, whether you're talking about trees or just in terms of uh, what, you know, we're talking about biodiversity in this whole group. So it seems to me, it, uh, by social, it, it kind of it limits uh, a landowner's choice or a property owner's choice in terms of what he wishes to uh, uh, to show off or show, showcase on his land. That's all. I'm just, I just, I'm, I'm, it's too <coughs> ambiguous. So, uh, no, I don't think it's worth yeah. burning a lot of time on. Uh, let's pull uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Let's make sure we get to the climate sections before yeah. we start yeah. so, any testimony on this. So the statement that you made, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, so that was going to ask you some questions. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. <clears throat> Not worth the time. Yeah. Scratch the scenic. So on Friday, we talked about uh, Before you move on, yeah. you know, I'm just looking at... Uh, Line 16, protection of uh, healthy ecosystems and Vermont preservation of agriculture productivity. I'm, I'm trying to understand the relationship of the two and how they would be envisioned to play out. So this this language is all used. Um, Act two fifty is supposed to be the tool to accomplish the goals set forward in the capability and development plan. So these are a list of <coughs> goals and priorities. Um, so this is adding the protection of healthy ecosystems to um, what it one of the goals that already exists is the preservation of agricultural and forest productivity. Yeah, and I understand that, but I'm still trying to understand the protection of healthy ecosystems and how agriculture and forestry would play out underneath, uh, you know, that in-depth 
So th this is a list of the things that are just, matters just. of the public good, as the very last piece of that sentence states. So I think I certainly agree that protection of healthy ecosystems are matters of public good. I think preservation of agriculture and forest productivity is a matter of the public good. Economic well, viability, yeah, all those things. I, I understand that. I'm just saying that agriculture and forestry are, you know, in the public good and viable agricultural units are important to our communities. But I'm wondering how it fits in with the protection of healthy ecosystems. In other words, is there going to be some trade-offs? Are there going to be some compromises being made between agriculture and forestry operations for the benefit of the overall health of the ecosystem and what, what would that be? Well, I think there already are trade-offs being made in that whole list. But Separate from the new language, that's, huh? there's, oh, there are trade-offs that we... No, but the protection of healthy ecosystems is new. And so I'm just trying to understand how it fits. I'm not saying I'm opposed to the concept. I'm just trying to understand, you know, where the ranking would be for ecosystem protection and having agriculture and forestry as being still, you know, uses of that environment. That'll come out, I think, as the bill unfolds. Okay. I'm not signing off on this until I understand it. <laughs> yeah, well, go ahead, Okay, so, so um, I'm going to see. So if you, you were saying what ranking does it have? Like, would the protection of ecosystems come before preservation of agricultural? Is that well, I'm just trying to understand how they fit together because Agriculture and forestry, I understand them. I understand that they have a lot of values beyond just the products that they produce. You know, like the, the timber and the, the feed and the livestock and the food that comes off the agricultural land. But then again, I know there's always been some conflicts between the Grado ecosystem management and those agriculture and forestry parcels. So I'm just trying to understand if yeah. we put that on as a priority how does the customary and ordinary operation of the land work? Does that, did you ever see that in statute or were you, were, do you see this as a ranking issue? Which is gonna come first, this or this? Or? Um, I, I don't, but I don't necessarily, I'm not an expert in this area. I don't necessarily know if there is a priority placed on certain things. The list has 19 things in it, and I don't necessarily know that they are um, valued um, differently. I think they're supposed to be the overarching goals, but I am not well, sure if they're used in a specific way currently. Well, the, the reason I'm asking the question is because under the Act 250 as it currently is, agriculture and forestry are looked at as uses of that land in and of itself. And now we're talking about being part of a greater scheme, a greater plan of uh, ecosystems and ecosystem management. So I'm just wondering what the role is. Representative um, Dolan. May I recommend on that, on that um, comment the original language was preservation, and keep that. And so, that, say the preservation of the agricultural forest productivity. But as it continues, when it reads, it lists things of a, a suite of matters of public good that include recreation and use of uh, mineral reserves, etc. So, if we, with your theme in mind, we can move protection of healthy ecosystem. Uh, ecosystems in Vermont or, the, or a preservation of that to follow um, or come right before I would say the protection of the beauty of the landscape. So can um, I just say, so, so it has the same. Right, so what line are you on? Right now the goal so of this has, meeting is not to do markup. Oh, okay. The goal oh. of this meeting is to get us grounded in the changes in statute recommended for climate change and then start hearing from witnesses who yeah. are going to testify on that. That's it. Okay. okay. So. But I think there's an easy way to address that, your concern. 
So let's keep going. Just to the climate change parts of the bill, please. Okay. Um, so on Friday we talked about new definitions um, that are in Section 6001. Um, many of that, multiple of them relate to the addition of climate change to the criteria. Do you want me to mention which definitions are specific to the climate change? Sure. What page is it on? Sure. So page 7. Uh, it starts on page 7 where we um, amend the definition of floodway to become flood hazard area. And then the change floodway fringe to river corridor. Then on page 11, there's a definition of air contaminant, which is used in the new criteria one. On page 12, there's a definition of greenhouse gas. Did you happen to find where that definition came from? Yes, so the greenhouse gas definition is similar to the definition in 10 BSA 552, but it's not identical. And I'm not entirely sure what the intent was, although I think it was, it's slightly different because it adds the district commission as a body that can um, determine what substance is a greenhouse gas. So I think perhaps it was rewritten. Uh, 552 gives power to the Secretary of Natural Resource, Resources to um, decide that. So this adds the District Commission. Um, so I think perhaps it was trying to give the District Commission some power in that decision um, in case this, the science um, develops further. Um, so then on page 32, we start the changes to the criteria. Three criteria were amended to address climate change more directly in Act 250. So currently, criteria one Criterion 1 uh, addresses both air and water pollution. And so what this change does is make Criterion 1 solely about air pollution and moves all of the existing water language to Criterion 2. Um, that's, in, that's currently in Criterion 1. Do you want me to walk through this language? Yes. Page 32, starting on line 3. Before granting a permit, the district commission shall find that the subdivision or development will not result in undue air pollution. In making this determination, the district commission shall at least consider the air contaminants and noise to, meet, to be emitted by the development or subdivision, if any. The proximity of the emission source to residences, population centers, and other sensitive receptors
third party verified and enforceable by the applicant and its successors and assigns and by the state of Vermont. The rules shall be adopted in consultation with the Secretary of Natural Resources and shall comply with greenhouse gas reduction goals of section 578 of this title. The development or subdivision will employ design and materials that are sufficient to enable the improvements to be constructed using buildings, roads, or up and other infrastructure to withstand and adapt to the effects of climate change, including extreme temperature events reasonably projected at the time of application. So that's the new criteria. result in undue water pollution before it just started with in making this determination well it did actually on page 32 yeah. line 5 so previously it said will not result in undue water or air pollution I see and so sort That's of split right there them out. Yeah. and then co the, co the existing criteria 2 and 3 are actually merged together to be the new three. Okay, thank you. So um, the next change is on page 35 where it changes the <laughs> sub criteria <laughs> to be flood hazard areas, river corridors, and so that uses the new definitions established in 6001. Page 35, line 9. So flood hazard areas, river corridors, a permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that in addition to all other applicable criteria, the development or subdivision of lands within a flood hazard area or river corridor will not restrict or divert the flow of flood waters, cause or contribute to fluvial erosion, and endanger the health, safety, and welfare of the public or of riparian owners during flooding. Do we have a definition for flood hazard area? Yes. So it's um, it's a new definition. It 
it's on page, it's, it's in this bill on page uh, eight, and it's the same definition that's already existing in Title 10, uh, and it was a, a, a definition developed, I believe it was developed in consultation with um, A&R's work on flood hazard areas. I hope I've characterized that correctly. Yes. Is it broader than what it's replacing? It's just lining it up with okay, the current definition. It's represented gold. Um, what's currently there is the term floodway, which is too narrowly defined under court law, they determined that the Act 250 floodway includes the flood hazard area. So both the flood, the term flood hazard area and floodway both come from the federal national flood insurance program. And, uh, but the floodway is the uh, active river channel, which, um, which oftentimes is where the, the river channel is, the wet part of the river channel, especially during a one or two year high flow. And then the special flood hazard area is, is an attempt to capture the so-called 100 year flood. Uh, um, you know, they're relying on 40 year old maps, so they're um, and 40 year old data, so they're outdated in terms of being useful. So, since the 19, gosh, uh, early 1990s, Act 250 has, through court case, had determined that the Act 250 floodway is a misnomer, and but needs to be fully capturing the flood hazard risk. So since the early 1990s to today, the agency natural resources, mostly through Act 138 that was passed post-tropical storm Irene, has redefined their flood protection laws to reflect this term called a river quarter and special flood hazard area. And this is what this attempts to do, is align what's already in statute based on Act 138. So it is a little more encompassing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, I would just, the only thing I was wondering is, um, it talks about the public, riparian owners, and it doesn't talk about, um, does it, do, it doesn't talk about animals, right? Does that matter? May I? Yes, Representative Goldman. Criterion 1D is a protection. It's mostly focused on um, flood hazards. For Act 250, it's so it's fundamental about public health and safety, and why it has that focus. All right, thank you. We know that River Corridor area, that what they, they often refer to that land adjacent to waters, riparian areas. We know it has ecological benefit, but the fundamental purpose of this part, this criterion in Act 250, is for protection and uh, public health, welfare, and safety. Bottom of page 36, uh, we merge the existing criterion two with the existing criterion three, and uh, call it water supply. <coughs> so it now reads: does have the sufficient water available for reasonably foreseeable needs of the subdivision or development? Will not cause an unreasonable burden on an existing water supply if one is utilized. And that's existing language that's now being combined into a single criteria. So then the last uh, change for, uh, related to climate change is on page 41. It's criteria 9F. Oh, actually, uh, with 37, the transportation changes that are related to climate change. Sure. So criterion five has been updated to include um, bicycle, pedestrian. Um, so criterion five A will not cause unreasonable congestion or unsafe conditions with respect to use of the highways, waterways, railways, airports, and airways, 
bicycle, pedestrian, and other transit infrastructure and other means of transportation existing or proposed. B, will incorporate transportation demand management strategies and provide safe access and connections to adjacent lands and facilities and to existing and planned pedestrian, bicycle, and transit networks and services. However, the District Commission may decline to require such a strategy, access, or connection if it finds that a reasonable person would not undertake the measure given the type, scale, and transportation impacts of the proposed development of And then um, on page 41, Line seven. Energy conservation and efficiency. A permit will be granted when it has been demonstrated by the applicant that in addition to all other applicable criteria, the planning and design of this subdivision or development reflect the principles of energy conservation and energy efficiency, including reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, from the use of energy and incorporates the best available technology for efficient use or recovery of energy. An applicant seeking an affirmative finding under this criterion shall provide evidence that the subdivision or development complies with the applicable building energy standards and stretch codes under 30 BSA section 51 or 53. You just don't know what a stretch code is. So it's a more stringent building energy code. It's a to the goal is to achieve greater energy savings that are um, required with the basic code. So those are the changes. I think a lot of other changes could be attributable to the goal of mitigating climate change, but those are not the direct ones. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks. Um, no, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. For the record, my name is Johanna Miller. I run the Energy and Climate Program at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, my guess is that you've had some of my colleagues in this chair we have already this session, but as you probably know, the NRC, we're a statewide independent environmental advocacy organization based just down at the end of this block here. Um, again, I run the Energy and Climate Program, but we have a water program, a forest and land use program, a sustainable communities program, and several in-house gurus related to Act 250, including our director, Brian Shoup, who's here, who's had far more experience with Act 250 than I have. But Again, I focus on energy and climate issues. That's my arena of expertise. And do a lot of work both on the policy front um, and have been thinking about this stuff for a while now, including um, I had the opportunity to serve as one of the 21 members of the Governor's Climate Action Commission. Um, I will note already right now of the five different things that the Climate Action Commission chose to focus on. Um, communities and landscapes, um, smart growth and good compact com development was a core component of that focus. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so you're, this is a really important conversation um, that you're having in a big lift, clearly, as you know, considering it's been 50 years since this landmark um, land use and development law has been instituted, and back then, um, very few, if any, people were certainly talking about or thinking about or understanding the science of climate change. It wasn't really an issue then, but almost 50 years later, not only is it an issue, but it's an urgent issue. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and then speak to some recommendations, support for some of the recommendations that are already in the draft bill and thoughts on adding a few others. Um, can, you but, hold, can you hold on one second? Christy, sure. um, Joanna's presentation is uploading on mine after a couple of refreshes. Mm -hmm. Is it like, it's right it here. Yeah. It's not working. All right. I'm going to try again. Are you try again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, her name is there. It's just not there. Yeah, That's all I have to say. Um, well, I just wanted 
to know, <clears throat> yeah, well, we do a lot of work um, in this building in various sort of policy arenas, state and regional conversations. Our work in general and my work especially is, is really informed by our work at the local level. Um, I coordinate the statewide network of town energy committees. There are about 130 of them now. Many of them are municipally appointed. Lots of you have um, energy committees that are active in your towns, working closely with your municipality. Um, good news, we just hosted a, a regional event with the Bennington County Regional Commission and just heard, I just heard yesterday that they're forming a new energy committee, a joint energy committee in Shaftesbury and North Bennington. So there's a lot of good work happening at the local level and more coming down. And as you locally are well aware, again, these groups working to help their communities, friends, neighbors, the municipality themselves reduce energy consumption, tackle climate change. So I just sort of frame that out to say that, you know, again, our, our policy positions are oftentimes very well informed by what we're doing at the local level. So, um, and Vermonters across the board, um, but certainly the folks that I work with quite a bit are deeply concerned about climate change and I wanted to just sort of spend a few minutes, um, if you indulge me, I won't be, take too long, but just sort of providing the frame for what you're talking about here when you're talking about Act 250, a landmark important um, land use and development law being updated to address the reality of our warming world um, and making sure that Vermonters are positioned to you know, thrive. Um, moving forward. So, again, essential frame. So, um, one that I hope that informs, you know, your work and our work um, broadly in the state of Vermont as you look to update Act 250. But the reality is, I mean, I think you know that we have a rapidly warming world. It's it's costly. It's consequential, and it's tied to how we generate and use energy and how we live and interact um, with the land which also has a lot to do with how we get around, how we heat our homes and buildings. So the science couldn't be more clear. Our global climate pollution is rising. We're currently at 406 parts per million. Um, of <clears throat> and as this chart shows, and just to say that 350 is what scientists say is sort of what is the good mark um, to be at for a sort of healthy, habitable planet. So we're now at 406 part per million and rising. And just to note that in 2005, when this legislative body, perhaps some of you are here, and then Governor Jim Douglas enshrined our statutory greenhouse gas emission goals, um, the uh, parts per million in the atmosphere at that point were 378. So in just over a decade, um, the parts per million of carbon pollution in the atmosphere have risen. Um, by 25 points. So it's pretty staggering and rapid increase in terms, and it means that it has pretty significant implications. Um, Representative McCullough. So um, I'd like to I'd like to suggest that the 350 parts um, was not a good place to be at, but was rather the tipping point from which we shall not return. Once we go beyond that, am I am I misremembering this, or because I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you characterize that as being a good place to be at, but now we're above that. No, three three hundred fifty parts per million um, in the atmosphere is what scientists say is sort of like what is like equilibrium for you know a happy, habitable, healthy planet. Um, and now we're at four hundred six parts per million. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what you know some of the latest um, research and science says in terms of what that actually means in a lot of ways. So getting back down to 350 parts per million is the target goal and, and, a, and a big um, challenge. Representative Bates has a question. I, sure. I hope I phrased this right. When was the last major climate change? Like how long ago was it? Oh man, when it was you know like the I'm just was curious. over. When was that, you think? I'm on that page. I can't remember. I guess I'm just trying to get a bearing on the, I I the exact dates. No, no, no. I'm just trying to think when, like, <laughs> in your opinion, since you're the expert on this, when was the last 
I mean, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Okay, so we're in a hundred of thousands of years cycle is what we're in. Tens, tens of thousands. And we're in that cycle now and it's just speeding up from how I'm understanding it. Well, I think what the, the science says and the leading scientists in the world say is that we are, I mean, there may be natural reasons for a changing sort of atmosphere, right. but it's the combustion of fossil fuels largely right. that is driving the rapid warming. And then also the rapid deforestation of our world's, you know, forests is, is, an, is another significant contributor to. But we're in that cycle. Is what, what I'm trying to get at. Well, we're in that cycle, and we are accelerating, amplifying, right, causing that cycle to intensify in a way that um, has never been seen. So our hundred thousand years is now coming to an end. It's been about 10 since the last major glaciation. Okay, that's all. I didn't know this. Okay. This is, I mean, I, I do not believe it. it's, I mean, there are natural cycles of the planet, but what is happening now is not a natural cycle. It is human caused. What is happening to, like, what is driving global warming is a human caused phenomenon. Right. Related to the combustion of fossil fuels largely, and also the deforestation of the world's forests. Other reasons, but largely it's the combustion of fossil fuels. Okay. Um, Dolan. I think your last slide shows some of that cycle, and kind yeah. of over the millennia. And I think this is what gives people concern, is because while it may be cyclical, getting, all of it is under the 300 parts per million, the last cycle was, as it shows, um, 125,000 years ago was the peak of it, of the carbon emissions. We've reached the, you know, the lull of it, and then the, what we've surpassed is the historic, since the last 400,000 years, the historic uh, maximum level of carbon dioxide. And, and if you traced with this, this just shows carbon dioxide emissions, and if you trace actual temperature rise, it coincides with this, and that's recognizing that warmer air can hold more volume of water in the atmosphere, and that leads to the you know extreme weather events. And so that's where the concern is. There's a climatologist just across the lake at Paul Smith College by the name of Stiglip Stiger, and he's given a number of uh, lectures on this phenomenon regionally, too. There's also a professor from the um, University of Texas at Austin, um, and uh, she, too, has looked at the impacts of this, this data, studied this data and its effect in the Northeast. So those are two good resources for more in-depth look at the um, cycle of the, the carbon levels. And I'm going to speak to one of those in a little bit more in just a moment, but point well taken. Thank you for pointing that out. So I just, just to sort of say, I mean, there's some 2016, the hottest year on record. I believe, um, you know, since 2001, we've had 18 of um, 18 out of the last 19 years have been the hottest on record. I mean, the long and short of it is what we're doing is 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 increasing, you know, warming our world, and it has impacts. And that's what I just want to highlight, because I think it gets down to what does it actually mean for us? Um, and what it means, you know, both globally and Vermont, is that you know, we're seeing more floods and at the, at the sea coast, sea levels are rising. Um, these are a few photos of high tide in Charleston, um, South Carolina. This is sort of just, you know, a, a, a usual day, right? It's, it's no longer, I mean, along the coast of Florida, there are several big cities that are also just, there's just regular sort of high tide consistent flooding. In Vermont, though, you know, that happens in different ways. Um, and as you are likely well aware, we all remember, you know, Irene. Um, we don't have coastlines like Florida or Louisiana or South Carolina, but we're not immune from flooding. And that's where I think really Act 50 um, and what you're exploring is, you know, there's a really important opportunity and need to look at how do we improve this important program to recognize and protect, you know, our communities from the impacts of flooding or ideally avoid being impacted from it. So 
So, you know, and I think Irene had some significant, not only environmental costs, but economic costs as well. I think up to the tune of about a million dollars um, we paid um, in hard costs, you know, displacing hundreds of Vermonters. I'm sure you've heard some, you know, harrowing stories of what that meant for people. Um, but, you know, our rivers were overflowing, you know, taking propane canisters and um, other pollutants along with it, you know, contaminating our state waterways. I mean, it had real significant application, um, implications. And, and I think also important to note that it disproportionately affected vulnerable Vermonters often, to, you know, who live in, you know, mobile homes or other areas that are more susceptible to flooding oftentimes. So um, just to note that we've, felt the implications of this, and it's highly likely that we will continue to feel them more intensely over the course of time. Um, and I just wanted to also highlight, considering the important work that you do when you're thinking about water um, uh, protection and Lake Champlain cleanup, um, there's a study that came out in 2016 that showed that you know Lake Champlain may be more susceptible to damage from climate change um, and that the rules created by the EPA to protect Lake Champlain may be inadequate to prevent, you know, algal blooms and water quality problems as our waters warm, as there are more intense or um, and more severe um, sort of rain and weather events, um, sort of exacerbating runoff and sort of excel, you know, just amplifying the problem that we're already struggling to find solutions to. So. Again, knowing that's an important piece of your work, I wanted to just sort of highlight that it has lots of implications and there's an opportunity to do something about it. And lastly, before I speak to some of um, the specific recommendations and thoughts related to Act 250, I just wanted to <clears throat> sort of, again, sort of set the frame about what it is that we're talking about, because um, the reality is that we live in a new era, certainly from when Act 250 was originally drafted uh, almost 50 years ago. You know, so updating that landmark law and harnessing it strategically to focus both on mitigation strategies, reducing you know, climate pollution, and then also adaptation strategies, figuring out how do we adapt and live and um, survive and thrive in a, this sort of new reality. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the reports. You very well may have seen them, but if you haven't, I do think that they're important to inform your work in um, looking at Act 250, but more broadly. Um, which is, you know, last summer, the Agency of Natural Resources released their Vermont Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory Report. Um, it was an update from the last one, which had been 2013. It was in, um, looked at the years 2014 and 2015. And what it showed was that despite um, our longtime statutory greenhouse gas and carbon pollution reduction goals, our greenhouse gas emissions went up 10% in just two years. So over the years 2014 and 2015, our state's greenhouse gas emissions, as opposed to following the trajectory of reducing emissions, which we have committed to in a tripartisan fashion, um, instead they rose dramatically, largely in the heating and transportation sector, um, our two most carbon intensive sectors in the state of Vermont. Um, <clears throat> but, so it's a pretty, significant increase, um, again, two areas where Act 250 could help in terms of improvement, both in transportation and in the building sector. Um, I also do just want to highlight that shortly after that, um, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC as people refer to it, sort of the world's leading climate scientists, they, they put a finer point on the science that they've been highlighting for decades related to climate change. Um, and what they found in that report, and I highly recommend you picking it up, it's a real pick-me-up, um, but it, what it really shows is what they say is that the world is warming rapidly and quote-unquote without unprecedented action across all sectors of our society, um, and quote, we're going to face serious social, economic, and environmental disruption. So, and they estimated that we have about now 11 years until 2030 to cut our collective global fossil fuel consumption um, in half. So by 2030, now 11 years, um, reducing our, again, global combustion of fossil fuels by half. So we got 11 years. Um, so it's a pretty significant um, challenge. 
if you were in the Energy Committee, I would be talking about it in terms of the opportunity as well. I fundamentally believe there's no greater economic development opportunity than proactively responding to climate change in smart and strategic ways. But that's a whole other conversation, and I know you have limited time today. But I would just say that there's pretty significant realities, both challenges and opportunities. Um, and then lastly, I just highlight um, on the National Climate Assessment, which is this fourth um, this fourth report here that rolled out the day after Thanksgiving. Um, the Trump administration quietly rolled that out while I was enjoying leftovers with my family. I hope you guys were too. Um, but that report was uh, um, sort of the work of over 12 federal agencies, um, and it was their sort of <clears throat> latest update analysis of what you know the science of climate change and what that means broadly across our economies. Um, they you know they have chapter by chapter sort of overview of like what are the high level takeaways from that analysis, but then they also get very specific. And this is what I believe Representative Dolan referenced is that there was a, a northeast section of that report that looks at what does climate change mean um, to our economies, to our ecology, um, to public health, to wildlife, to forest, to habitat. Um, in the northeast, the lead author of that report was a, um, a professor at the University of Vermont named Leslie dupigny Giroux. I highly recommend you checking that out because it does get into the more sort of deep specificity about what climate impacts are to our region. So again, I would just say, speak a little bit more about you know what that means to the to your important work at hand. But I think the important frame is that when Act 250 was first implemented and instituted, it was a very different world. And you have, I think, an important opportunity for you now to think about how do you strategically update it to serve as one tool in our toolbox, certainly not the singular tool. And like I said before, there's a lot of really good um, bipartisan, tripartisan support, um, supported work happening here in Vermont related to different strategies to address climate change, mitigate, and adapt. But I think Act 250 um, is a really important program and tool um, to help you know set our communities up for um, mitigating and adapting to a warmer world. So um, <clears throat> again, just wanted to highlight that speak specifically about um, some of the recommendations and then offer a couple of other ideas. But first, starting with saying that I think we support, you know, listening to the walkthrough of the, the bill just now. I think the support the Commission on the Future of Act 250's recommendations, what's reflected in the draft bill related to changes to Criterion 1. Um, I do think it's important to note that I believe Act 250 can, you know, does and can address climate change, but I think really being more explicit and articulating how and, and, and making sure that it is explicitly referenced will um, strengthen, I think, the, the program and the bill. So um, ensuring that um, adding greenhouse gas emissions specifically as currently in the draft is really important. And then <coughs> one other recommendation that we would respectfully encourage you, urge you to consider is that um, ensuring that any new development, that Act 250 serves as a tool to ensure that any new development is consistent with our state's statutory greenhouse gas emission goals. Um, so that's really, so making sure that when we're thinking about, you know, planning new development, making, you know, because most of Act 250 is new development. So making sure that those developments are set up um, to be less energy consumptive, more strategically located, um, is really important. So I think a lens and an important um, sort of parameter to assess developments by is to make sure that they're consistent with our um, long-held um, statutory greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Um, and then I wanted to just sort of speak to and support the recommendations currently in the draft bill are the changes um, where looking to enhance protections from lot hazard areas and river corridors. So we know a lot of development occurs in river corridors. As we noted before, they're more prone to flooding. Um, so 
really believe that what is in the draft bill is an important step forward. Um, a couple of other specific, specific recommendations. Um, as, as, we, as I mentioned, as you are likely very well aware, um, transportation is the largest greenhouse gas emissions um, emitting sector in the state. Um, so a really important opportunity to update Act 250 to reflect that. Um, so we support the Act 250 Commission's recommended changes to this criterion, um, which are really focused on sort of helping people figure, you know, creating mobility options and not, you know, primarily or more singularly focusing on single occupancy vehicles, but really <coughs> embedding the focus on transportation choices and transportation mobility options. Um, so all kinds of different <coughs> Um, opportunities for people in the transportation sector and more specifically an, another addition we'd love for you to consider is um, recommending provisions in there that sort of um, that highlight the need for electrification so vehicle electrification so supporting um, charging stations um, in, in developments so incorporating EV charging infrastructure is another piece um, of this provision and then lastly, when it comes to Criterion 9F, just wanted to say that we support the um, expanding it to include um, energy efficiency. As you know, conservation is you know, not using energy, turning the thermostat down, wearing a sweater, um, and energy efficiency is more efficient technology. So buildings that um, incorporate that, um, we can use Act 250 as a tool to ensure that that happens. But that's definitely something that we support and I hope you will too. Um, and that's that's really it. I think I just wanted to sort of thank you for um, indulging me in just setting a little bit of a, a higher level frame in terms of the climate science. I don't know if, I hope I didn't, I wasn't too repetitive. I don't know how much you've um, delved into the, the latest science, um, but I think it's a really important um, frame for your consideration in general and all the important work that you do, but also this Act 250 update and um, and I said, when I look at your when you know, I look at your chalkboard and it says what will be our legacy, I really think it's important that as people look back and look at how this body updated Act 250 to respond to the realities of this day and age, I think climate will be at front and center in terms of a pressing issue and an opportunity to set the stage for our communities to really thrive in the 21st century. So I'm happy to take any questions if you have more specific Act 250 questions. I did bring the Act 250 guru, um, but I really just appreciate your time and your focus on uh, you know, enhancing and updating Act 250 in general, and certainly your considerations of updating it to reflect, to adapt, and mitigate to time. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question on the Criterion 1 recommendation. Mm -hmm. Um, about adding that any new development complies with our statutory greenhouse gas emissions. Can you give me an example, or what does that look like, or what, is it different than what we're pursuing now? I think that you know, if you're looking at developments in, I think you need to imagine developments related to where they are cited, how they are cited, how developments proposed to or can integrate, again, mobility options, building design. I think the goal is to make sure that it is not exacerbating the problem and instead is recognizing that we need to build developments that actually use less energy, both in the, like, the built landscape itself, but also, excuse me, both in the buildings, building itself, and in the location. So I think it's really, it's, it's a lens that, just like you have recommended, um, giving the agency enough of resources per view to consider, um, <clears throat> to consider this criterion. I think it, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the entities that are responsible for our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets largely, our greenhouse gas inventory, and I think this will give them guideposts to help, and district commissions to help assess um, developments through that kind of lens. Um, 
Uh, my question is about um, your point uh, inquiring about, um, and I think throughout our documents we talk about design and materials <coughs> used for um, for projects to to enable us to both mitigate, i.e., reduce carbon as well as adapt, make it more resilient to flooding, and. Um, like your opinion on um, what do you think that means? I understand Vermont has pretty rigorous building uh, energy codes. Um, so how how would we, in recognition of what you had said in the very start, you said that the two major sectors contributing the lion's share of the carbon emissions or the greenhouse gas emissions our transportation sector and our heating sector. Yep. So that heating sector I want to kind of fundamentally focus on. Um, what would that look like? How, do, how would we, and what should we do to focusing on that sector and looking at design and materials that can help us at, um, improve our, um, our both reductions and adaptations? Well, I would say that <clears throat> while we've taken steps to improve, you know, create stronger building codes and some communities are moving towards, and I like to see reference here in the stretch code, we have a lot, lot of room for improvement there. Um, I, and I do know um, that you're going to hear from a, at least one potentially other very specific energy efficiency, energy code experts. I think you're having Richard Daisy come in and he will speak oh. um, hopefully he just canceled because he has a cold <laughs> oh. well, well, he, he, he can call in and not we'll contaminate get. you all but I, I do believe you know the long and the short of it is you know sort of really setting parameters around what kind of um, you know what we're expecting when people build you know new buildings in the state of Vermont because the long and the short of it is it may cost a little bit more up front to design a more efficient building, but it is far more affordable over the long term. So let me just, may I follow up? Yes. Just, because um, he I've heard two opinions. One is that we have a very stringent code, energy efficiency code, we're just not doing enforcement of it. And then I've heard, no, we need improvement on our code. So I'm just trying to get a better sense for how we can address what the, what the need is. Well, I, I mean, I would say to you right now that you know, obviously you, you can get lots of different opinions on all kinds of different issues, but I, some of the um, folks that I work with at the local level, including um, building contractors, um, we there's a lot of room for improvement. We have some, and I know that the department is doing good work in terms of updating our energy codes, but they're not nearly as aggressive as they need to be and should be. Um, so I think there's... A, a focus on that and you know from my perspective not wanting to be too prescriptive here um, but really making sure the developments are required to meet um, the, the higher building code I recommend is the stretch code and I mean setting a bar I know it was kind of controversial there was something in the bill that you're going to move towards net zero um, and I think that ultimately that's where we get, need, need to get to as fast as possible, but recognizing that we also need to make sure that, you know, that we're being reasonable in how we move forward towards making progress here. Thank you. Can you help us understand a little more about the stretch code? Not really. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it really just, it, we have some baseline energy codes, but it really says that we're gonna go further I believe, and I can clarify this um, later, but I think South Burlington has um, is, the, is the first municipality, currently the only municipality that has implemented um, a municipal stretch code thus far. Um, but it just essentially says we're going to go above and beyond what is required um, at the state level um, to ensure that our new developments are more energy efficient um, and far more affordable in the long term. Representative McCullough. Well, um question, but on this particular topic, uh, I'm pretty sure we don't have, for instance, um, thermal efficiency codes in the state of Vermont for, for residential. There may be some for commercial um, and industrial, uh, but this may be an 
area that really needs to be. It's not an Act 50 conversation, really. It's 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 an area that 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 would really need to be looked at and addressed. And Act 50 would then reference perhaps the new thermal efficient the thermal efficiency codes. Minimum standards when enacted, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I think it might yeah. um, overall centers. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but my 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 uh, question and, and comment. So I, I think back to criteria one, uh, recommending adding new development that complies with the reduction, and then I'm not, you know, fine. Maybe that's a good place for it, but I would go all the way. Criteria 9F, the end of your presentation, mm -hmm. and there's a question there, and, and um, there is a distinct difference between conservation and energy efficiency, and so um, so your suggestion to expand to specifically include energy efficiency um, would go back to that stretch code kind of a thing. Um, when enacted, um, development shall uh, shall be a minimum standard thermal and electrical mm -hmm. efficiencies. Um, but conservation, what, how, what are you, at? we probably aren't going to get them to turn off their lights. Uh, everybody will see it's afraid of the dark. They need their lights on all night long. Important point, which is why I was glad to see it reflected in your proposed or the, the, the recommendations from the commission and then in the draft bill. That it, I think, you know, obviously conservation, as I was saying, as you all know, is just avoiding using energy. So make it as, you know, figure out ways to avoid usage. And efficiency is when you're building that new house or your, your house is. You make sure that you have it wired, or that you require like LED lights and you know outside lighting. Like very, the technology has evolved so much that it is so so much less expensive. Again, even in, you know in the initial investment, but also certainly in the long run in terms of. So what I'd also say is the department is doing some really good work on the energy codes, and I think they have some. Just, great expertise there and they could come in and give you an update. I know they're in the process and looking to 2030 to set the stage for annual progress towards far more stringent energy codes. So I do sort of recommend that Kelly, Kelly Launder over there is an expert and I think she can do a good overview of what's happening and the value of it. Representative of Fave. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, is there any financial incentive now in uh, running by the state runs to make uh, developers uh, build buildings that are energy self-sufficient? Especially in terms of setting up something like solar panels on rooftops and things like that that would basically cut their consumption of fossil fuel generated power. I don't know about sort of a, a package program for developers in particular, but Thanks to you all, there's lots of different programs that incentivize people, and certainly developers are among those people to install solar. To you know, we have Efficiency Vermont that helps customers, and certainly a lot of um, businesses and private contractors, you know, avail themselves of different sort of incentives for energy efficiency. And I think that they're taking advantage of the programs that you all have help to create, that our utilities are also um, helping to create. So I don't think, and I'm happy to be corrected if there's any sort of like package that's specifically for the you know, private <coughs> development community, but I do think we have a lot of programs that they can avail themselves of, and they do, in large part because customers are, I think, asking for it. More people are interested in you know, getting off of fossil fuels, being 100% of the fossil fuels that we use, they're looking for energy independence, and they're they're recognizing that fossil fuels are volatilely priced. 
you know, using less energy, setting the stage for that, and moving to things like cold climate heat pumps, which is another technology that I know a lot of developments are exploring um, as integrating as part of as part of their development package. So I don't I don't think there's anything as tidy as what you're describing, but I do think there's um, a lot available to everyone. I'm really talking about the industrial or commercial level. Uh -huh. where, and Efficiency Vermont has a lot of programs that serve those customers. Okay, we kind of have to move yeah. on. Um, yeah, I'll just play one more. Okay. Um, kind of mentioned this, okay, I, I think one interesting opportunity for us is to think about um, instead of locking onto a code. What we've done in, in Waters, we lock on to what's called the best available technology. And, and I know we've done that in um, even in managing stormwater when the changing climate. You look on best available um, temp, uh, um, uh, weather patterns and precipitation information. So I throw that out when, when we think about a code, it's either a couple of wanting to get compliance to an existing code, but if we're always thinking that the code is going to be obsolete as soon as we write it down on paper, maybe the strategy here would be to think about how do we incentivize or require uh, compliance to something that would be more along the lines of a, a best available technology for maximum efficiency that can achieve the stretch standards or uh, on the codes that are in place. Anyway, just a thought. All right, thank you so much thank for you so coming much. in. Thank you. Uh, so for the record, my name is Everhart Bonka. I'm here testifying on behalf of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Appreciate the time to uh, focus in on, on housing and housing affordability and uh, appreciate uh, the committee's uh, work so far and obviously also the Act 215 uh, commissions. Um, so just because uh, I'm not sure everybody around the table is familiar with the organization, um, we are an 80 member statewide coalition and we include um, all of the affordable housing developers that are most of the nonprofits that um, have developed um, cumulatively and collectively well over uh, 12, 13,000 uh, homes, affordable uh, rentals in the, in the state of Vermont. Um, and we also, uh, in our membership, include homeless shelters, um, some of the designated agencies, community action agencies, a broad array of groups that uh, are involved in uh, affordable housing work and anti-poverty work, and really any organization that um, needs affordable housing for uh, its, uh, its clients. And clearly, everyone needs uh, housing that's affordable and safe. Uh, to them or they are missing out on, on the foundations that everyone needs uh, in, their, in their lives. Um, just a little bit by way of background, um, we've been involved in a number of um, iterations of um, uh, looking at uh, designation areas and providing uh, some um, exemption, some relief from uh, Act 250 uh, at the local level. Um, so each of the successive stages, um, number that. I think 10 years ago, there was uh, first uh, five tiers of uh, different size, uh, different population towns that um, received uh, for their, uh, for certain designation areas, uh, certain uh, exemptions for units, uh, for developments up to a certain number of, uh, of units. And our uh, affordable housing developers have made extensive use of that. They develop in designation areas. They follow smart growth principles and um, have uh, been very actively involved in building new downtowns, uh, building um, new, uh, new town centers. Uh, Brenda will mention uh, one of the developments that they're involved in uh, uh, in South Burlington's uh, new, uh, new city center, for example. Um, so our, our developers have uh, made extensive use uh, and have received the benefit of not having to go through both uh, the local plans review process and uh, the Act 250 uh, process in the areas um, that have been affected by what used to be a, a kind of a five-tiered system based on town population uh, and um, the provision of uh, certain affordability requirements. And, um, Committee members um, will hopefully recall that um, two years ago, the top two tiers, uh, which were the, uh, pop the towns with populations of about 15,000, between 10 and 15,000, uh, basically removed uh, the, uh, the threshold.
goals above which um, housing developments um, would be required to go through Act, uh, Act 250. We are very supportive of the idea of, for, uh, of, of desi uh, enhanced, uh, enhanced designations and um, are supportive in appropriate locations um, for um, um, housing developments, especially, particularly if they have an affordability component, uh, not having to go through uh, both, of those, um, both of those levels uh, of review and, and um, support the uh, committees and the commission's efforts um, to uh, create the enhanced, uh, the enhanced designation. That said, um, and we are hoping that this is an unintended consequence, but maybe not, um, there uh, were priority housing affordability. There were requirements for affordability and inclusive housing under the priority housing designation um, that uh, appear to be getting lost uh, in, uh, in, in the enhanced, uh, what we've seen um, in the proposals for enhanced uh, designations. And uh, so my, the main thrust of my testimony, and, and Brenda's uh, also after me from Champlain Housing Trust, uh, would be to ask you, uh, as you are um, writing the bill and creating um, enhanced designation areas, not to lose that minimum uh, requirement of inclusivity for some affordable housing. And um, that, that's kind of the main point that uh, I'd like to make uh, today. And what I wanted to do also was give you folks just some ideas of, and some um, uh, you know, feel for how bad are affordable housing shortages and how bad are affordability gap is, both for rental housing and home ownership, and why we need to maintain uh, a basic minimum threshold of affordability as we move towards enhanced designation. Uh, and ultimately, what we'd like to see is some version of what is now considered to be priority housing as a requirement maintained in the enhanced designation areas. Um, and let me just also add that uh, two years ago, um, as part of a, a larger housing bill that included the uh, housing bond that um, went to uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board um, that's been creating hundreds of new, uh, new units and uh, fully rehab units around the state. As part of that, there was a pretty uh, in-depth discussion um, around affordability requirements, um, and uh, there were actually efforts to, um, to reduce the, um, the targeting and the inclusivity under uh, priority, uh, priority housing. And, and so here we are again two years later having, I, I think, a, a similar discussion. And uh, we hope that um, you land on the side of maintaining those basic affordability requirements that are currently in law for priority housing projects, uh, and more specifically for uh, what, in, uh, uh, what is uh, defined as mixed income housing and mixed use housing. And I'll, I'll go over um, what the exact requirements are for those um, shortly. Uh, before I do, um, I did want to just quickly go over uh, what's on your screen here, just give you a, a, a quick overview of um, rental housing afford uh, affordability or lack thereof in our state. Um, and maybe just pull out a couple of data points from uh, what you're seeing on the screen. Um, and that is um, what we call our housing wage. This is an average uh, wage that you would need to earn if you're working 40 hours a week um, 52 weeks a year. It is $22.40 an hour, and that's what you need to earn as a household, um, whether you have one wage earner or two, to afford a modest two-bedroom apartment on average in the state of Vermont. And clearly, uh, our uh, current minimum wage is substantially below that, so somebody working at, um, at, a, at minimum wage or at a low wage service sector job will need more than one income in the household to afford that modest two bedroom apartment. Obviously it varies around the state, in the Northeast Kingdom it's uh, substantially lower, um, but if, um, if I scroll down briefly you can see in the uh, Burlington, South Burlington metropolitan statistical area it's fully $27.73 an hour. So clearly the gap between what a, a large number of Vermonters, working Vermonters, um, can afford and uh, 
sorry, what, what they're earning and what they would need to earn to afford a modest two-bedroom apartment um, is, is out of whack, and there's a very large gap. If you look at Addison County, our housing wage for that two-bedroom apartment is $19.63 an hour, still substantially above um, what minimum wage, current minimum wage is, it's even above the $15 an hour minimum wage that um, is uh, proposed uh, for us to go to in, 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 in a uh, couple of years, and um, the bill is making, making its way through the, um, the building. Um, let me just also highlight that for renters, and about 29% of Vermonters rent uh, their, their homes as opposed to owning. We have a 71% home ownership rate, which is very high uh, nationally. Um, but the uh, average renter wage is $12.85 an hour. So for the average renter, there's a very substantial gap between what uh, they, they can afford, uh, what they need to earn, um, and what they are earning on average. Uh, in order, uh, in order to afford a, a modest two-bedroom apartment. Representative Lafay has a question for you. Do you account Please. for that disparity? How do we account for that disparity? Yes. How does it, how does it come how, to be such a widespread? Um, ha house, housing is housing is expensive, um, and it's expensive in Vermont. It's expensive throughout the Northeast. Um, even in the Northeast Kingdom, it's, uh, it's relatively expensive compared to, say, uh, the Midwest. Uh, housing affordability is, is a national problem. It's a problem um, that is uh, predominant on the eastern and western, uh, western coasts and in, in areas like Hawaii and in major metropolitan areas, but Vermont is no, uh, no exception. We have uh, some of the highest rents in the northeast of, uh, the northeast of Boston. And I, I would say it's you know there are a number there are a number of factors. It's a kind of, it's a pretty complicated um, it's sure a it complicated is. answer to that that has many many factors. So is it they, comparable to the other New England states such as Maine and New Hampshire? Yeah. So uh, I didn't provide this here, but um, so that twelve dollars and eighty five cents average renter wage. Yeah. Um, we have the fifth largest gap among all states between uh, the renter the average renter wage and uh, the housing wage. Uh, and behind us, right behind us, so we're five, and six, seven, eight, nine are all the other New England states uh, except uh, Rhode Island. So Maine is expensive, Massachusetts is expensive. Uh, part of it is our older housing stock. Um, it's uh, less energy efficient. Uh, it needs uh, upgrading. It needs ener energy efficiency upgrades. There's lead paint. Um, there's, you know, we're a built-in environment. Uh, a lot of our development is infill. Um, as, as opposed to, you know, we don't want to build in on prime ag soils, obviously. Um, that's what this committee is all, all about, is making sure that we're going to concentrate development in the areas where we want it and leave the other areas working forest lands and, and uh, agricultural lands working and uh, also open for our very large tourist industry and for folks coming from that state to enjoy. So. So just quickly, who are the ones ahead of us on that gap? Um, so uh, ahead of us are Washington, D.C., incredibly expensive. Hawaii, um, Northern California is, uh, is, is ahead of us. Um, yeah. uh, and then certain counties, you know, counties in Connecticut, counties in Westchester County in, in, uh, uh, in, in New York. Representative McCullough. I'm not getting your heart the difference between the average renter wage mm -hmm. and the Average per hour housing wage. So, uh, so it's, it's about a ten dollar an hour difference. Well, I see the math, right? <laughs> but the, the, what's the difference between the average renter and the average I'm housing sorry. person? I'll, I'll step back. So, um, we have a criterion for affordability. Um, if you are um, paying more than thirty percent of your income for your shelter costs, oh, yeah. if your renter is renting utilities, if you're paying more than thirty percent, then you're living in housing that is not affordable to you, uh, and that you don't have enough left over for other basic life necessities. Yeah. And uh, if you're paying forty or fifty or even sixty and sometimes seventy percent of your disposable income for your shelter costs, yeah. you're one step away from homelessness. You're one uh, one major car repair or uh, one one injury or one sickness uh, away away from not being able to pay the rent and, and potentially um, losing your housing. So $22.40 an hour is what you need to earn so that the uh, typical two-bedroom apartment 
um, which is um, one thousand. It's up in red in the in the language in the yeah, top. So these are twenty eighteen figures. Uh, it's one thousand one hundred sixty five dollars a month, including utilities. So by that thirty percent standard of affordability, uh, to afford one thousand one hundred sixty five a month in rent and utilities, you need to earn twenty two dollars and forty cents an hour. That's it's simple math. It's very simple math. Yeah, but the average renter wage. So the average renter wage is they're they're only earning. Twelve eighty-five an hour, so they are ten dollars an hour short of being able to afford that affordable two-bedroom apartment um, based on that thirty percent. They're the standard. same people, but these guys are only getting twelve eighty-five, not twenty-two. Yeah, yes, that's, that's right. The twenty-two forty is what you need to earn. Right. The twelve eighty-five is what those folks on average okay. are earning. So ten dollar gap. Okay, Thank so you. we have another witness, and we're Got already it. behind. So let's Festival, one thing, one quick law thing. Thank you. Uh, the maintain affordability requirements mixed use mixed, mixed income already in the law. Is that state law you're talking about? Yes. Um, so we have uh, two years ago we went through um, General Assembly, went through a process of aligning, aligning the definitions of affordability both in Chapter 117 and in, uh, in Act 250. Um, and you know, if, there, if there's limited time, this is not simple stuff, and there's I don't a lot of math. I just wanted it. to know if it was the um, local thing you were talking about. Because then I wanted to ask state, about we, we, have, we have definitions for affordability in both Chapter 117 and uh, Act 250. We also have the definitions of mixed income, mixed use, and they have basic requirements for affordability. That's all I want to know. And then inclusivity, that does not mean inclusive zoning it, let a it, particular it, city might have. It, 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 does, it does not. It's comparable in the sense of um, what we're asking is that in order to receive um, this basic uh, enhancement of uh, you know not having to go through Act 250 um, and these uh, for enhanced designations that basic levels of affordability as currently defined in law remain okay. uh, and that they not be lost. Um, otherwise, we have you know you're going to have a workforce that's going to uh, not be located near services, not be located near their jobs. They're going to uh, continue to have to commute halfway across the state to get to. Um, where, where they work. Um, and I, let me just uh, also point out that the other uh, handout that I provided to you, uh, this was also uh, required in law two years ago when um, um, the enhanced, uh, the, excuse me, the designation areas were, were last reviewed uh, in this committee and in other committees. Um, one of the requirements, and the question was, well, what do these affordability requirements mean? How are developers going to know? You know, what's their price point for a new uh, single-family home? What's the price point that they have to target for those uh, affordable um, those affordable units in their development? And, and by the way, it's only for mixed income. It's only 20% of the uh, of the development for rental that needs to be affordable to people at or below 80% of the HUD area median. And what I've highlighted here for rental housing is the 80% row. Uh, that shows you um, the, the incomes uh, at 80% of the HUD area median income for all areas outside of Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle in the top tier of, of, of rows. And so what would be affordable to, for rental for folks at that 80% threshold, which is what's set in uh, current law, um, for a one-bedroom apartment, it's $1,195, include rent and utilities. For a two-bedroom, it's $1,435. So uh, if you move down um, the 80% threshold for rental housing in Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle, which are known as the metropolitan statistical area, um, there clearly your 80% your, um, threshold uh, is higher. It's uh, for a three-person household, it's uh, 66960 um, annual income. And the um, rent affordable uh, to that um, to that household uh, would have to be uh, 1,674. So for Chittenden County, that's still below market, but it's not hugely below market. It's maybe three or 400 uh, two-bedroom apartment new construction in Chittenden County. Last time I looked was in the 1,900 range uh, per month. So these, this is relatively shallow affordability. It's not a large percentage, uh, uh, a high percentage of units. And then there's um, uh, another standard of affordability for mixed, uh, mixed income housing for home ownership, which is pegged to the Vermont Housing Finance Agency's percentages of their 
uh, purchase price limits. And if you look uh, to the far right, the three far right columns, um, the one, two, and three bedroom uh, homes, uh, those affordability thresholds are uh, 237,283 uh, and 328,000 um, outside of Chitton, Franklin, and Grand Isle, and then they're higher, uh, higher within. So this is not deep affordability because you know, we're not necessarily providing additional public subsidy. Uh, this is uh, just a, uh, would be a requirement for developers to um, develop in an area uh, that had received the enhanced designation and that would allow them not to have to go through the uh, Act 250 process, just the local uh, plans review uh, process. And one other benefit I would say for making, making sure that uh, affordability is included in there is uh, a lot of times a uh, private sector developer will come in and say, well, I haven't, you know, I want to do some affordable housing, uh, but that's really not my area of expertise. Um, we have nonprofits that are expert at that. That's our, our network of folks. They can bring in uh, some public, uh, additional public funds, like through the Housing Conservation Board, federal dollars, uh, and they can actually uh, achieve a deeper level of affordability than what's required uh, in, uh, in law. And oftentimes, a private sector developer will partner with our nonprofits um, because, again, affordable housing is not necessarily their area of expertise, but this brings in a partnership and creates public-private. Um, if, if you uh, maintain the affordability requirement in the enhanced designation areas, I think it will continue to encourage public-private partnerships with our nonprofits that would um, provide even greater levels of affordability um, because of the public sector uh, funds that they can bring to bear on, on the housing. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll rest there. Um, I want to make sure Brenda um, has uh, has time um, as well. Sorry. Not much. I guess I, uh, Brenda, are you with us? Oh. Uh, she, 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 she might have me on mute. Are you there, Brenda? Hello, can you hear me? Not really. Can you get a little closer? Can you hear me? Hello? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me all right or does it cut in and out? I was having challenges listening and I don't want that to be happening to you. It's working pretty well right now. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so should I dive right in? Yeah. Sure. Uh, just a little FYI, we're, we're definitely running a little behind, so. Okay. Continue. I won't take long. And uh, thanks. I wish I could see all your faces, but I appreciate you making these opportunities available to us. Remotely as well. Um, members of the committee, Madam Chair, I want to thank you for the opportunity to comment on the changes you're considering to Act 250. I support the goals of this bill to create a coordinated and predictable review process that will encourage development in areas appropriate for growth. I do not. I do not support the elimination of incentives to include affordable homes in housing development. As I understand it, the incentives in the priority housing provisions of current law would be lost if all development in areas with enhanced designations are exempted from review. Before I address these points, I'd like to take a minute or two and give you a brief thumbnail of Champlain Housing Trust, our current activity, as well as our approach to development, which is pertinent to your committee's priorities. We serve the three northwest counties of Vermont with nearly 3,000 affordable homes and related programs that serve people from homelessness to homeownership. Over 6,000 Vermonters go to sleep every night in the Champlain Housing Trust home, and over 1,000 more use our financial education programs annually. Most of our homes are affordable apartments that serve the workforce. We also have properties set aside to house people with special needs, and these have services attached, provided by community partners. Over 600 homes are in our shared equity home ownership program, and these have served 1,100 families. We also help people to buy homes in the market. We provide affordable rehab funds and services to lower income homeowners, and we operate a statewide mobile home purchase program with buyers referred to us from the uh, regional nonprofit. All our homes, whether they're rental or home ownership homes, are permanently affordable to the people of our region. And this supports the community and economic development goals of various towns, 
of the village and cities because they know that the housing mix that they plan for and work to implement is there to serve their community for the long term. 16% of our rentals are occupied by people who are homeless, and last year, 88 of our 313 vacancies were leased up to people, making that first step from homelessness. As part of this, then we also now deliver an array of services and programs to help people stay housed. This ranges from budget and financial counseling, to loans and rent forbearance, to deep social work and case management in partnership with others. Now, our development policy is a policy of smart growth. Opportunities that do not meet this threshold criteria are not even considered. We build more densely and we build smaller homes than our typical in Vermont, and this meets both our affordability and smart growth priorities. All of our homes meet very high energy conservation standards, so much so that we include heat and hot water in our rent. We use solar for hot water extensively and have solar arrays on many of our flat roof buildings that provide power to the grid. We've also prioritized redevelopment in our town, village, and city centers, adapting old buildings to current uses, reducing waste that goes in the landfills, preserving historic properties, as well as Vermont's traditional settlement patterns. Finally, where, where appropriate, we also conserve open space as part of our development, and these include public parks and other uses like bike paths, trails, fishing, and waterfront access. Our current development activities are a case in point. We have 60 apartments under construction in South Burlington's new city center, another 76 in a new very dense and green redevelopment of a former college site um, on Burlington's waterfront that will ultimately be 700 homes in all. We are developing housing in St. Albans in downtown. It's a, in a mixed income and mixed use project. We've also purchased the rental complex of 105 apartments this year in South Burlington. These run subsidized but affordable to people at below 80% median income. And if they had been sold to market, the rents would have gone much higher and uh, many people would have been displaced. So we've purchased that for affordability. Now, I know that we are in a high-demand, high-cost region, and our work is badly needed. For every apartment we lease up, there are seven fully eligible and approved households that have to go on waiting lists. But affordable housing is needed statewide. A VPR poll in the fall identified high housing costs as the number one cause of stress and anxiety among Vermont families, by far. And no wonder. The housing wage gap is high for Vermont workers, even in semi-skilled and starting professional jobs. And you just heard the data from Earhart. I won't repeat it, but I would add one thing to the question that you asked about why is there a gap? But we all know that nationally, wages have been essentially flat for over a generation. But housing costs go up. They go up with the inflation of construction and land, and, and so, while Vermont is one of the high-cost areas, we are not alone in facing this crisis around the country. And that means, means we all have to redouble our efforts to plan for and provide affordable housing. This is why any planning incentives or regulatory relief offered for housing development needs to require affordability as one of the qualifying criteria. We know that land costs in these developable areas of the state are high as are new construction costs overall. If we do not require an income mix that includes affordability, these new neighborhoods with the better access to services, transportation, jobs, and other amenities will exclude a large plurality of the workforce just due to cost. New standards of construction to address energy use and resiliency to weather events will only add to the cost of building. And this better housing stock needs to be available to Vermonters of all income. The state has funding sources and network of affordable housing developers, both for and nonprofit, and other resources to support such mixed income development. Given Vermont's well-documented need for more affordable housing, it's imperative that we preserve the affordability targets that <coughs> currently give housing developments with a mix of incomes priority under Act 250 
Neither H-197 nor the committee's draft bill right now includes any housing affordability targets among the new criteria qualifying for permit, permit newbies. The amendment to this bill affirm or enhance design criteria, protection of wildlife and natural habitat, including waterways, historic preservation, and the preservation of youth. All important things. But these leave out the most important consideration of residential development. Equitable access to Vermont's most precious resource, our people. Our people of all walks of life, jobs, age, ability, and income. I have just two uh, other more general suggestions about the proposed reform that do echo recommendations made by the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. The first is that before creating a, a new designation, consideration could be given to reviewing all the multiple designations we have to see if any can be sort of merged, folded in, rationalized in the process. All of the designations have the purpose of facilitating development in built up areas. A related point on this is that some of these designations, especially the downtown districts, uh, have been very narrowly drawn and these could maybe be expanded. In closing, I would encourage you to assure that all future measures that are taken to protect Vermont's natural resources, preserve our traditional settlement patterns, and reduce our carbon footprint are undertaken with a commitment to social equity and equality of access. This means that we have to consider the cost of these solutions, who pays for them, and who benefits from them. Lower income Vermonters in mobile homes bore the brunt of laws from Chocolate Storm I mean. They had the hardest time accessing equally affordable replacement housing. We now know that without intentional planning for affordability, those with fewer resources, who as a group have the lower carbon footprint, will be priced out and thus left out of our more sustainable and resilient communities and homes. Please include affordable housing in all planning designations, and please consider affordability in any new construction and weatherization standards, and please do count on Champlain Housing Trust and Vermont's whole network of affordable housing producers to assist you in developing socially and economically equitable solutions to climate change, and also to assisting our communities and developers who do seek to include affordable housing in Vermont's new neighborhood. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. <coughs> I think we're going to uh, shift gears here. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having us, and thank you for your brightest testimony. We have uh, shifting gears again to Jeff Nelson. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, so, uh, my name is Jeff Nelson, and I'm with DHB, which is an engineering environmental consulting firm. Um, I sent my I sent some uh, documents to the committee assistant earlier, but I think one of the first one includes my bio, which is there for your perusal. Um, Just by way of background, um, since obviously there's some new members in the committee, I, I've testified to the a number of times in the past on the various uh, water and environmental issues. Um, um, I've been working as a uh, water resources environmental consultant in Vermont for many years, have um, been involved with um, a number of stakeholder processes as um, new regulations have been considered. Um, developed and I've worked on many different types of projects, um, various permitting efforts related to stormwater, wetlands, water quality, etc. Um, our firm um, does a pretty broad range of work, um, design, analysis, permitting. Um, we work for ski resorts, we work for utilities, we work on renewable energy developments, we work with commercial developments, and we work on transportation projects. So we're touching a, a pretty broad range of um, land use um, and energy activities that are occurring in Vermont and have been for, for many years. Um, 
I'm not here today representing any particular entity. Um, I'm here as, a, as an expert and um, imparting, if you will, my professional opinion based on my experience. And, um, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to do that. Um, so I wanted to touch on, on two um, aspects of what the committee is considering um, in the context of the Act 250 bill. Um, first is energy saving, um, and then the second is climate change. Um, so with respect to energy saving, um, as I mentioned, uh, we've been involved in a pretty broad range of projects, um, including a lot of energy projects. I've personally worked on um, all three of the large wind projects that have been permitted and constructed in Vermont, Sheffield, Kingdom Wind, and Deerfield Wind. I'm very familiar with a lot of the particular issues related to those projects. Um, so as I think you know, um, the Public Utility Commission, formerly the Public Service Board, has been regulating land use related to energy and telecommunications projects for something like 50 years in Vermont. So there's a lot of history there uh, with the PUC um, and the regulation of these kinds of projects. Um, in addition to the overlay of PUC, or in the case of, of development projects, Act 250, um, today there is a very broad array of what we call collateral permits that are required for projects. So those would include things like wetland permits, stormwater permits, um, permits associated with rivers and streams and buffers and impacts to a very threatened or endangered species. And so, each of those permits have their own process that is independently triggered um, that apply to projects that reach certain jurisdictional thresholds. Um, so with respect to the Section 248 process and the, um, the work of the, of the Public Utility Commission, um, I've prepared a few slides that I'd just like to go through. Um, the first one is, um, this is a map that um, we prepared in the context of the Kingdom Wind project um, when that project was being reviewed by the then Public Service Board. Um, and one of the concerns that was raised by A&R at the time of that application was the potential for um, fragmentation of forest habitat. And um, under Section 248 of the Public Service Board, PUC now administers, um, there's a provision that requires that um, the project have no undue adverse effect on the natural environment. So in the context of that very broad language, um, a &R scientists um, raised a concern about the potential for the project to impact um, this forested habitat. And so as a result of that, um, in order to address the concerns about habitat, um, what happened was a &R scientists identified some very critical areas that, from a habitat connectivity standpoint, so to the south, so the kingdom, just by orientation, so this is um, Route 100 coming up through Lowell, um, the Kingdom Wind Project, uh, the access road comes up to the ridge line, and then the turbine string is along the ridge. Um, what the ANR scientists had identified was a, a particularly important area to the south of the project that provided connectivity for wildlife between the Green River area and then the low mountains to the north. Um, and there was concern about potential for development in these areas. Um, and so ultimately, um, GMP agreed to um, obtain conservation easements on these parcels which had totaled about 2,000 acres um, to address the habitat fragmentation, habitat connectivity concerns. So um, I just thought it was important for the committee to understand that because um, you know, even though there isn't an exact criterion under Section 248 today that requires, um, that says habitat fragmentation, it talks about no undue adverse effect to the natural environment in a case where concerns get raised, like here, uh, about the potential for such an impact. Um, there's a process that's already in place that enables a and scientists to raise their hands and say, this is an issue. 
we need to hear from the applicant about how they're going to address it. And this is what we came up with, and this is what the agency agreed was sufficient to ensure that that, that impact would be sufficiently mitigated. Um, Can I just quickly? Sure. It's this proposed conservation. Was this, so is this completed? It is completed. In fact, um, in the, uh, the CPG, the Certificate of Public Good that the board issued, um, they required that these conservation easements be in place prior to the start of construction, um, prior to any activity that could fragment the habitat, if you will. So this, this map was prepared before um, everything was executed, but um, the, uh, the, uh, the easements were in place prior to construction. Okay. Representative Dolan and then Odie. Hey. Good afternoon. Uh, my question was just about, um, it, and maybe it's too specific about this project, but was the conservation mitigation project here, and apples to oranges, were, was the attempt to try to recognize that, in this case, this ridgeline development had specific habitat function that was well, obviously going to be affected, thereby the conservation secured here was to address and provide the same type of um, protection, same type of habitat protection. That it wasn't was exactly the same type of habitat because the, the impacts uh, associated with the project were on the bridge line, and the, the two parcels that are shown here um, to the south are not. But um, from uh, a connectivity standpoint and, and sort of availability of habitat to wildlife using the area, these were the parcels that the agency staff had identified as the most important ones to conserve. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't exactly apples to apples in terms of the exact same type of habitat, but it was I don't want to use the word critical habitat because that word has different meanings. But it was habitat that was identified as the most important for conservation, in recognition of the fact that there were going to be some impacts associated with the project. Is no undue adverse effect the same kind of standard as no adverse impact? Um, well, to some extent, I suppose that's a legal question. But um, you know, obviously, um, in the context of a particular application, um, there needs to be a review of that based on the, the, the evidence, based on the data, and based on the you know the input from agency scientists and from you know, consultant scientists that are working on an application to, to make the determination. Um, I guess I can't answer the question directly because it's so fact specific or depending on a particular site or particular project. And then one more. So the impact has to be mitigated. We heard testimony that your field still isn't, they still don't have the land, it's, that's uh, the mitigation land. And do you, do you know whether Sheffield and Kingdom have that same issue? Certainly not Kingdom. As I testified a few minutes ago, these easements were in place before construction began. Um, and my understanding at Sheffield uh, is the same was true, that the mitigation was completed um, at the time the project was constructed. I'm, my involvement in Deerfield has been on the water quality, stormwater issues, not on the wildlife issues, so I don't know one way or the other the status of, of those uh, conservation and mitigation conditions. Okay, so you're saying if you get that conservation easement before the project goes in, then the land gets, then there's mitigation, but if not in Deerfield, was it was after? Well, that was in the case of Kingdom Wind, that's what the, the Public Service Board. Um, ordered, if you will, in their decision that for that particular case, they wanted GMP to get the conservations in place before construction started. But there's no rule or statute that I'm aware of that requires that all the time. But in that particular case, that was the, the board's decision. Representative um, Lopez. What evidence do you rely on to show that the mitigation is working as you intended it to? Um, that's a good question. It's not, it's, it, 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 you know, this is not a circumstance where, um, you know, there is um, sort of, you know, monitoring, if you will, to look at what has happened. It's really, you know, dur during the review of a proposed project, um, the 
professionals involved use their, their best professional judgment to make um, a recommendation, and that's really what ends up being a requirement. So um, I'm not aware, I mean, I know the agency has general programs to monitor wildlife movements and so forth, but I'm not aware of anything specific beyond that. Am I correct in believing that you worked on all three of these major projects? That's right? correct, yes. Yeah. And basically what you did was um, more or less look for ways to mitigate whatever adverse impacts it would be as a result of the uh, development? Well, um, our, our role was, um, you know, we, had, we worked on um, all three of these in somewhat different capacities in terms of what our specific role in the project was, but um, a significant, I guess, a common denominator is working on stormwater and water quality issues. and. Um, in the context of all three projects to, to manage the runoff, and that was actually something else I was going to talk about a little bit. Okay. Um, so, you know, that actually kind of tees that up. Um, you know, some of the other suggested impacts, such as stormwater and erosion and so forth, are regulated under these other agency permits, um, and um, those provide. Um, oversight in terms of construction, operations, monitoring. Um, I know the committee has seen some pictures. I wanted to show you a few, too, from, from Lowell, um, just to illustrate kind of the current condition, not as of today, but within the last year, of some of the stormwater treatment practices that are there. Um, this happens to be one of the stormwater ponds where some of the runoff from the from the roads on the project come in. Um, and this little four bay is where a lot of the sand and silt settles out. It goes into this pool, and then the water rises up and flows out. Um, there was also, I think, testimony about oops, what's called a level spreader. Um, the level spreaders were, and I've been in this committee speaking about level spreaders several times in the past. but. Um, these, these devices were used to really reduce the amount of forest clearing. I mean, we talked a little bit about mitigation, but a big part of the effort on the part of the project was to, to actually reduce how much forest had to be cleared in the first place. Um, and these, were a, these um, stormwater practices were used to achieve that. So in this case, the stormwater comes in off the road, flows into this, this trench, if you will. Um, you can see this was after a rainstorm, so the water's a little bit cloudy. It rises up and then flows over the level lip out into the forested area um, that is below the, the, the spreader. Um, here's another example. Again, um, see the road up here, the water coming in, cloudy water during a storm. That cloudiness is getting settled out in the spreader, and then the water is flowing out over the lip. Yes. So when you look at what's happening with the water, are you taking into account the seeds in the water? The, you know, like the birds fly over and bring invasive species and then drop it in the water and then it gets washed into the forest. Um, there is there is an ongoing taken over by invasive species. Yeah, there is an ongoing monitoring that was part of the um, the order of the uh, PUC to monitor for invasive species and to, to remove those, yeah. and so that is ongoing. Um, but how can you give a report that the, that the water is going to be okay when it's going to have the invasive species seeds in it because of the clearing, they can take root? Well, that's why there's a condition to, to monitor and to, um, to address any invasives that are found. Um, and that monitoring has been ongoing, and I, I'd say successful, in terms of addressing the, the concerns that, that there are. I mean, there have been some invasives found, and that's been, you know, the condition has required that they be eradicated. Um, Is that a level of faith? Um, the level spreaders, um, am I correct in recalling that they were really put in to help um, avoid erosion? That's correct, yeah. I mean, basically to provide for treatment of sediment and to manage the flow of water. And um, how has that worked? I mean, what happens? We saw a slide that showed the possible, showed the, um, the, um, the, the trenches filling up with water, so the water was going over the top uh, from beginning to end in terms of the entire length. So it, it, it gives the impression that 
it was the, 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 wasn't enough capacity. Yeah, no, the, the systems um, have been um, undergoing ongoing testing, um, and that was a requirement of stormwater permit. Um, we just completed the final year's report on the level spreaders and filed that with DEC. Um, and you know the systems have been working exactly as designed. That's not to say that they don't need maintenance from time to time. Um, any stormwater treatment system does, and the the result has been that the systems are working and they're meeting the, the standards that they're intended to meet. We did um, provide back. Um, so we did provide, um, as part of this, um, two things. One is um, there was a testimony given by Annette Smith recently that, um, spoke, that showed a lot of pictures um, from 2016 and earlier. Um, and I wanted the committee to have this letter from December of 2016 uh, from DEC that addressed uh, a number of, just all of those questions and, and comments. Um, and uh, so I think that, I'm not gonna go through that in detail, but I wanted you to be aware that the information that she showed you from 20, early 2016 um, was either outdated, incorrect, or was addressed by subsequent work that was done in terms of maintaining the system. Um, I would also point out that we have prepared on the performance of the level spreaders. Um, I reported to this committee back in April of 2016 on the work at that point. Um, as part of today's exhibits, I have provided an updated summary of these systems, how they've been working, and um, what we found as a result. And so that is in the in the list of exhibits. Is this part of the documentation you provided? That's correct, yeah. yeah. Um, so I wanted to move on and talk for a moment about um, potential changes to energy siting approach. Um, as the committee knows, there have been quite a few changes in land use regulation of energy projects over the last few years. Um, some of which increased the, the role of local and regional energy plans in um, consideration of energy projects. Um, also, um, looking at, in the case of solar, preferred sites that are things like landfills and brownfields, but not agricultural fields. Um, so, you know, some of these are, are big changes that have occurred. Um, I would also note that the PUC has very specialized um, rules and expertise on things like net metering, looking at aesthetics impacts, requirements for decommissioning, which has been a requirement of all the wind projects that I've been speaking about, um, looking at impacts from of sound from wind sites and so forth. Um, so I guess my point is that before um, making a change that may have sort of unpredictable consequences, um, in transferring um, energy siting from Section 248 to Act 250, um, I guess I would urge careful consideration and also um, time and opportunity for the existing changes that have been recently made that I just spoke about to, to work. Um, um, I also feel, as I said, that you know, the, the scope of Section 248 gives the PUC um, pretty broad ability to look at the specific concerns and issues associated with a particular site, such as what I spoke about with Kingdom Lynn. Representative um, Odie has a question. Is it appropriate to ask whether the witness is here of his own volition or whether he's being paid to be here by anyone? Sure. Okay. I'm here on my own time. I'm volunteering to be here today. Um, I have coordinated um, with um, Rev with Rural Village of Vermont and, you know, in terms of coming here. Um, and I have also um, communicated with Green Mountain Power to simply obtain permission to use some of the materials that we prepared related to Kingdom. Thank you. Sure. Representative Dolan. 
Um, my question is in regards to your last comment about um, Section 248. Yes. And I, I'm not as familiar with that process, so um, if you can help me out in better understanding it. Um, but as I understood um, 30 years ago or so when I was on the Public Utility <coughs> Commission and Public Service Board, it, the 248 criterion were to merit, mirror the Act 250 criteria. And the, as I understood, I wasn't ever involved in those uh, projects, but um, but the I think the intent was to integrate the Act 250 criteria. I can only assume the intent was to integrate the Act 250 criteria into 248 decision making process to, to be able to have one body handling through through their process uh, decisions that would trigger the similar kind of evaluation using similar criteria. So when we're here trying to look at ways to bring Act 250 into the 21st century, so to speak, you know, to, to give it a facelift, how do we, how would it, in your mind, work under 248? Because it would mean, in my mind, if we don't do anything under 248, the, the difference is going to result in a substantial, potential substantial difference between the criteria that haven't been updated, that are still 30 plus years old in 248 process versus a, a new and improved Act 250 process. So so we, we're, I'm trying to grapple with your last comment in terms of trying to understand how we can best ensure um, predictability in the system when you're talking about development under both um, t development types. So, um that might be more of a, a legal or a, or a legislative drafting question than a, a technical question than I can answer, but I'll give my answer and then you can take it for what it's worth. Thank you. Um, so um, you're correct in your understanding that um, there are Act 250 criteria that are incorporated in the Section 248 review. So all the water-related criteria, soil erosion, um, endangered species, you know, et cetera. Um, and the, the reference in Section 248 is to the criteria of Act 250. So it says, you know, Section 6086A1 through 8. And so I guess what that would mean to me is that if the Act 250 criteria changed to whatever they changed to, and this didn't change in the, in the 248, that it changes okay. with it. I, I, okay. think. I think that there are a couple other people who could help us, but that's what we've heard in the past. So, okay. Greg? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's accurate. The, 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 for the criteria record. that are referenced specifically in 248 Greg, are. Just for the record. Well, I'm sorry. Greg Bobo, the National Resources Board. Um, the criteria that are referenced specifically are uh, uh, 1 through 8 and 9K. So, I, I, I think it's fair to say that if the, if the criteria changed in Act 250, they're automatically, uh, those changes would be incorporated into 248. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say a couple words about the, the climate change aspect of the bill that the committee is considering. Um, I guess, first of all, um, I, I would agree that um, this seems like, to use Carrie's, uh, Representative Dolan's term about the, you know, facelift, I think this is, um, this is probably the right time to, to consider this, um, you know, while Act 250 is being, being looked at comprehensively. Um, I would note, however, that to some degree, um, some of the a a &R agency programs that already exist, um, you know, I think take this, the potential um, impacts of climate change into account. And um, there are others here that could speak to this as well, but the, you know, the fact that um, ANR has a rule that addresses river corridors and the, the planning around river corridors considers you know, potential extreme events that could occur over time. Um, so I think there's been some thinking that um, you know, we need to plan for the future and be prepared for changes that could occur, um, if not explicitly, um, somewhat implicitly. But I, I guess I also feel that um, you know, there, there may be some additional opportunities. Um, and I think one thing that would, would make sense for the committee to consider is um, some kind of an ANR-led stakeholder effort to, 
to really look at what exists currently um, that could address um, concerns about mitigation and adaptation for climate change and what some recommendations might be for future changes. I think right now, um, you know, there's, there's not enough um, kind of understanding, in my mind at least, about what's already out there um, and what other um, um, needs and opportunities there might be. So that would be my recommendation that, you know, there be some you know, stakeholder process to, to look at that. And, I would say from my, my own experience from having been involved in a number of those stakeholder processes that um, you know, not everybody gets everything they wanted, but um, I feel that me and Vermont have done a pretty good job with those. I've been involved in several of them, um, most notably with stormwater, several stormwater stakeholder groups over the years. And um, I think they've been very successful in um, modernizing updating our stormwater regs, recognizing new technologies, new approaches, um, and also you know, the need to, to improve what we're doing in terms of managing water quality. So you know, my experience, um, you know, getting a diverse group of stakeholders together and having people come to the table willing to work hard to make something happen um, is, is something that um, can happen and I think there's a good track record of having that. Anyway, those are those are the items I wanted to cover and happy to answer any additional questions that folks may have. Um, I guess you, your first comment about A and R rules already and I guess programs already take things into account, but you only mentioned river corridors. Are there other examples that you want to bring to us? I mean well, I mean, I, I guess that's where I think the stakeholder group could be useful to really tease that out. I mean, I guess, like, for another example, um, when you look at developing a water supply, you need to look at the long-term sustainable yield of an aquifer, and that would consider, um, you know, kind of the long-term availability of water based on the, the characteristics of recharge and so forth. So it doesn't explicitly say climate change, but the, the scientific methods that people use to evaluate well yield, for example, consider what's available for water and what the, what the sort of record is of groundwater and, and uh, recharge. So um, that's where I felt that, you know, kind of understanding what the, the processes and rates are that we have in place today, what they do to consider potential changes to the hydrologic system um, associated with future climate change, and then kind of building off of that as a starting point, um, and then you know, using that to, to look at what, what more might want to be done. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Representative Faith. Uh, you seem to suggest if there was a, a transfer of jurisdiction from 248 to 250, that something would be lost in that transfer, uh, that uh, Act 250 would be at the disadvantage of being behind in what's taken place in these kind of sightings and what's gone in to prepare for them. And I'm wondering, uh, since most, if, if you're if you're looking at basically the technical aspects of the job, or you're also looking at the, the, uh, the environmental ones? I would say both. Um, certainly, you know, technical in terms of um, understanding energy projects, whether they be, you know, electric projects, gas projects, renewable projects, but also, um, you know, looking at environmental considerations because obviously there, you know, there's a certain universe of energy projects that we have in Vermont, whether they're transmission lines, whether they're solar projects and what have you, and there's between, you know, the PUC commissioners and the, the staff, there's a pretty deep well of knowledge and experience of how these kinds of projects um, get designed, what the potential impacts are, and then when you layer onto that the collateral, the agency permits that have to be obtained, um, that I think it's a system that um, is very effective in protecting the environment. Um, and as I said before, I feel in some ways it's more protective than Act 250 because of the ability to look at things, for example, like habitat connectivity and, and fragmentation issues such as the kingdom wind. Well, let me ask you this then. Of the criticism I have read in terms of the projects that have occurred, let's say, in, West, in, uh, 
in Lowell and uh, Sheffield, the criticism hasn't been so much technical as it has been environmental, mm -hmm. suggesting that you know the environmental considerations are not given their due weight and to push these uh, projects forward. And I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking that the technical aspects are something that you know maybe PUC is better equipped mm -hmm. to handle, but I'm not so willing to concede that uh, Act 250 would not have the upper leg when it came to uh, trying to measure the impact that this project was having on the environment or what it would have. And uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, uh, since we are an environmental uh, committee, uh, that's where my pri our priority lies. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how, you, how, you, how you square the two. Yeah, I, I guess um, two thoughts. First of all, um, whether it's Act 250 or Section 248, um, I feel like that the heavy lifting gets done outside of those processes. Um, so um, with a &R permits um, and in the case of Kingdom Wind, um, you know, there was a special monitoring requirement that became part of the stormwater permit because of the level spreaders that we used. Um, so that would occur um, e either way, um, and you know there are other examples of permits that, like for example, with Kingdom Wind again, um, there was a water quality certification that required monitoring of all the streams on the mountain um, and to ensure that they were continuing to meet water quality standards. Um, so you know again, these permits are really great. they're they're going to be required of a project regardless of whether it's Act 250 or Section 248. Um, and then I guess the second point is what I said before about just there being um, a long track record um, within the PUC of reviewing these projects. And I, I just don't see, I, mean, I don't see any basis for there being less environmental protection. I mean, it's the same Act 250 criteria that are incorporated and um, with all the collateral permits, I mean, oftentimes, I do a lot of Act 250 work. The Act 250 condi condition on wetlands, for example, will be get your state wetlands permit and you comply with the Act 250 criteria. So they're not doing any separate review. They're basically saying get your agency permit, which you would do whether you had a 248 or Act 250. Um, I have a question. I'm wondering what you see the future of wind power in Vermont being. Um, I guess <laughs> my personal, my, well, I, I, I think that it is probably fairly unlikely that we're going to see any more wind projects in, a, in, the, in the near term. Um, I, I, I guess I'd be surprised if, if there were any. Um, <laughs> Why? Um, it seems as though there's been um, quite a lot of um, opposition that uh, exists, um, and um, I just I don't know. I mean, it seems as though that's. Uh, so you think it's social reasons? I guess put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't see that um, technical issues would prevent this from from wind projects from occurring. I mean, you know, I feel very comfortable that the designs that were done. Sheffield, Deerfield, and Kingdom, um, you know, were protective of the environment, both from a water standpoint and habitat standpoint. Um, so that's not the reason that I don't expect wind projects. I just, you know, your comment about social concerns probably is, is what it is. Right. Any last questions for Mr. Nelson before we let him go? Thank you so much for coming in. Sure. Thanks for your time. Thank you. All right, committee, we are um, adjourned.